Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming, and I'd like to welcome you to the 21st season of the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus presentations. I'd like to do a special thanks to our co-chairs of the caucus, um, Representative Bar uh, Brian Bilbray from California, Representative Charlie Dent from Pennsylvania, Representative Jackie Spear from California, and Representative Rush Holt from New Jersey for their commitment, dedication, and ongoing support. Um, for the of the caucus. Um, as you can see, we do videotape our briefings. You can find past briefings on the CLS website at coalitionforlifesciences.org. Um, and you can also register for RSS feeds in order to be alerted to future postings. Um, and now I would like to uh, take this time to introduce Dr. Keith Flaherty. Dr. Flaherty received a Bachelor of Science from Yale University and a medical degree from John Hopkins University. He trained in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and completed a fellowship in medical oncology at the University of Pennsylvania, where he joined the faculty. Dr. Flaherty currently serves as Director of Developmental Therapeutics for the can uh, Cancer Center at Massachusetts General Hospital and as a lecturer at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Flaherty's primary focus has been to perform clinical trials with molecular targeted therapies. He is internationally known for expertise in clinical and translational research, having led numerous clinical trial investigations um, for the clinical effect and predictive markers of novel targeted therapy regimens. Getting all that? You beautifully <laughs> said. Yeah. Dr. Flaherty's cutting edge research has been supported by the NIH through K23 and R01 grant fundings. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Flaherty. Thank, Thank you. you. No, 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 no. Not allowed to applaud before I've actually said anything, because you really don't know if you're going to enjoy what I have to say. No, joking. Thank you for the long format introduction. Um, could have like maybe posted that on one slide and then quickly gone through it. Um, so uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. And I'm going to... Um, be really uh, delving into a couple very specific examples of recent, and by recent I mean certainly within the past decade, but even a bit more recent than that, developments um, in a particular type of cancer, melanoma. Um, but all of the comments I'm going to make from beginning to end are very much meant to be um, certainly generalizable to cancer and the cancer research enterprise broadly. Um, and if I fail to do that, then uh, at least during sort of question and answer and discussion time, then, then we'll make sure to address those points. Um, I did want to get into some specifics because, of course, you know, sort of speaking in generalities for 20 minutes um, could, could get many of you to the exits rather quick um, or get you to sleep. But uh, I think it's a, it's a key time um, in the melanoma field as it comes to uh, trying to translate scientific discovery into therapy uh, to be able to sort of try to understand, okay, what, what has been the basis of that success? How can we then roll that success out um, to sort of cover the entire spectrum of cancer? But yet, what are our current limits still? In other words, sort of what's holding us back from, from um, even bigger uh, game-changing impact in cancer? So, uh, so melanoma is a disease that, um, unlike some other cancers, we've not seen a whole lot of progress um, in, in recent decades and years. So I'm showing you just a couple of, uh, of uh, pieces of data, epidemiologic data here. Uh, so here's breast cancer incidence, so the number of, of new cases of breast cancer. Um, and, the, and the number of fatalities from breast cancer. Um, and this is per 100,000 uh, uh, people in the population. So, so breast cancer incidence and then the death rate here, you can see obviously that there's a significant gap, which is the cure, uh, cure rate from this disease. Um, and what you can see is actually the incidence appears to be going down a little bit uh, with breast cancer and, and somewhat steadily since about 1990 uh, through the present time, you actually see a decrease, a pretty significant decrease about a, thir a third reduction uh, in the risk of death from breast cancer, um, which has to do with early detection and diagnosis, um, improvements in treatment, you know, be they surgical or medical treatments as well, and there's basically been sort of success in every one of those categories. Um, but you can see pretty convincingly that the trajectory is down. And there's other cancers where you could point to, uh, maybe not as common as breast cancer, where you could say the same phenomenon is happening, where we're starting to see a, a turn um, in terms of fatality from, uh, and, and morbidity from these cancers, the burden of the disease overall. Melanoma is one of a fair number of cancers, but it is the cancer I specialize in clinically and in terms of my research, so it's, it certainly serves today's purpose well, um, of a cancer that's actually been increasing in its incidence. So notice the curve here in terms of the number of new cases. And behind that, meaning lagging behind that, um, has been an increase in the death rate uh, from this disease. Um, we're, we're worried, obviously, based on this increasing incidence uh, year by year 
uh, through recent times um, that we're going to see this death rate actually just continue to climb because um, the, t the lag between a new case and a potential fatality from that case is oftentimes several years. Um, so we may actually see this uh, continue to rise. There are numerous cancer types where this is the case, where basically you know, we, we've really not seen any kind of um, significant improvement in outcome. And you could blame early detection and diagnosis. You could blame you know, you know, inadequate uh, surgical techniques. And certainly, you could blame inadequate medical therapy, um, maybe all of them. But the bottom line is we just haven't seen progress there. So I'm going I'm to focus on this particular unmet need area. But certainly, there are other cancer types one could focus on. So the revolution in cancer, I'm going to uh, come back to this, uh, the reason why I'm showing this compl complicated cartoon in just a moment. The revolution in cancer has been the molecular understanding of cancer, which really started, um, I guess you could say, in, in the 1970s when the war on cancer was first declared and funding to the NIH and the NCI specifically first um, was put in place. Uh, certainly in the 80s, in earnest, that investment began to turn return a molecular understanding of cancer. Um, that molecular understanding of cancer has only started to inform treatment of cancer in the past decade. So the first drug therapies that actually take advantage of a molecular understanding of this disease are about 10 years old. But that's just the, the very beginning of it. And now we're starting to see um, a, a real a proliferation, multiplication of the types of drug therapies that are coming along that take advantage of this knowledge. If you think back to the types of medical therapies for cancer, for advanced cases of cancer that are beyond what surgery can, can manage, chemotherapy drugs, which is the sort of term chemo that many people think of for cancer drug therapy, uh, first came to being in the mid-50s and up through about the mid-90s even. That was about all the world uh, had to offer in terms of new types of cancer treatments. They all fell within the definition of chemotherapy. What does chemotherapy mean? Basically, drugs that were developed because they could kill cancer cells in the test tube, and they didn't quite harm, uh, let's say, an intact mouse quite as much as they harmed the cancer cells, so it seemed like there was a little bit of an angle to work with there in terms of trying to develop these further. Some of them in humans turned out to actually be more harm than help, and, and they didn't make it on uh, to be uh, standard therapies. The ones that made it were the ones that still had at least some margin, if you will, being more toxic to cancer cells than to the, to the intact uh, person. Um, having said that, their mechanism, in other words, the basis by which they worked, was not known as those drugs were brought forward one, and, one by one. In other words, they, they were brought into clinical testing and even in, in many cases became approved drugs without a deep understanding of why they worked. We call that empiric drug development, which is sort of like feeling blindly, if you will. It's the unraveling of how cells work. This is a, a picture, if you will, of a normal cell, um, sort of the wiring of these cells. How do cells grow? How do they multiply? How do they travel uh, when they need to travel? Um, how do they sort of you know, execute these kinds of programs, if you will? Uh, well, understanding that wiring has been the revolution of the 1970s forward, particularly the 1980s forward, but, but certainly the seeds of it were first planted as long ago as the 70s. Um, and it turns out that what cancer does is basically co-opt these normal processes, okay? So if you think about what a cancer needs to accomplish, it needs to do a bunch of things that, uh, that a normal cell in a given part of the body um, doesn't no normally do. Um, so let's use a lung cancer to start with. So a lung cell, once it becomes a lung cell, shouldn't be multiplying, uh, you know, a, a thousand-fold or a million-fold. It should just be sitting there quietly, and if it needs to replace itself, it will do that in a very civilized way, uh, you know, creating one uh, uh, offspring, if you will. So to, to, to wake up the program, if you will, that allows it to multiply, 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 um, that's a program that's in the genetic code, but it's not one that a lung cell is supposed to be tapping into normally. Similarly, traveling. Um, cancer cells to become fatal have to be able to spread. Um, a lung cell is not supposed to be able to spread. So for a lung cell to pick up and go to the liver and, and be happy there um, is a major challenge, actually. If you actually took a lung cell and put it in the liver, it would die immediately uh, because it doesn't recognize that environment, and that environment is not supportive of it. But there are cells in the body, uh, like immune cells, for example, that happily travel around the body. That's their job is to travel around the body and, and find infection uh, and clear infection. So the program, if you will, is in the genetic code to be able to travel. So a lung cell has to wake up that traveling program. How does it do it? Well, it basically takes over these processes, these pathways, um, to, to execute those kinds of programs. So, so you can look at the um, actual genetic alterations or mutations that accumulate in a cell that's on its way to becoming cancer, um, and you can enumerate those changes. 
you can also look at these sort of properties that I was just referring to, these things that, that cancer has to be able to pull off to actually successfully be cancer. And in either domain, you can identify uh, molecules, pathways, sort of individual points of potential intervention with drug therapy. So we, and we have examples of both, and I'm going to go through an example in each category that have now proven uh, to be sort of game changers uh, in melanoma, uh, but also are, are populating other cancer areas as well. So there are therapeutic opportunities either in the actual sort of targeting the things that are altered and then, and then downstream of that as well. But to be absolutely clear, and this is a point that I'm going to close on uh, when I get to my last slide, it's absolutely clear to us that cancer is at least as complicated as HIV. And so when you think about HIV therapy and what worked in HIV therapy, one drug therapy, single drug therapy, actually was enough to temporarily, transiently knock down viral load um, and sort of temporarily forestall the progression of that disease and the ultimate fatality of that disease. Two drug therapy induced meaningful remissions that lasted for years. Three drug therapy has created decades long survivors that are still going and we don't think they'll ever stop. So that idea of combination therapy attacking at a molecular level different points of the HIV virus is exactly what we think we need to do in cancer. And to get there, it's actually going to take things from column A and column B of some of the approaches that I'm, I've already uh, described a little bit. In other words, we've uncovered some of the genetic alterations that actually can be directly targeted with drugs, and I'll show you one example of, the, of, of that. Um, but that, that approach by itself, while it can buy people time and be a meaningful therapy, is not a permanent fix. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are drug approaches that actually try to reverse some of these bad behaviors, if you will, by drugging specific molecules that are not genetically altered or mutated, but are part of these processes or these behaviors. And it's ultimately the combination regimens, two drug, three drug, we're not exactly sure how many combinations, um, that we think we're going to need. But to be absolutely clear, in the past 10 years, since the first so-called targeted therapies have come along in cancer, we've only had individual successes. In other words, one drug at a time. So think back to AZT, which was the first HIV drug that actually did something, at least transiently, uh, against the HIV virus. Um, that's where we are right now, is in the AZT era of cancer therapy, and trying to figure out how to get to you know, ra rationally, scientifically, and quickly to combination therapy is actually where we are in the cancer field in terms of our biggest uphill climb. So the understanding of cancer molecular biology, this idea that there's genetic alterations um, that actually are the, the initiating events, um, that, that really has been uh, much of the exploration. And, uh, you know, really this is where an enormous amount of publicly funded research has given us this, this understanding or unraveled this, this code, if you will. So currently the so-called Cancer Genome Atlas and, and, and other parallel efforts um, are trying to now completely decode um, the 60,000 genes of known function plus the other ones of unknown function and how mutations in them might relate to cancer. And part of that type of effort is what uncovered this mutation in, a, in an enzyme uh, referred to as BRAF. Um, and the exact function of it I'll get into a little bit, but not a lot. Suffice to say, this is just one amongst 60,000 genes of known function in our, in our genetic code. Um, and if you look in cancers, and in this initial investigation, they looked at 480 some odd cancers of various types, including melanoma, lung cancer, and so on. And what they found when they looked at the genetic code of this enzyme, which is what's laid out here, is that at one particular position in the genetic code, frequently there were mutations in cancer. Just at one particular place, you saw this huge peak of, of mutations. And this is not an accident. In other words, this is sort of nature telling you that this genetic alteration is on a random event. If it was a random event, you'd find mutations all along the, the genetic code. But they were piling up at one place because something was happening there that made this thing function in a way that was helpful to cancer. So uh, what that one mutation does is turn on this enzyme BRAF, which is part of a bucket brigade, or so-called signal transduction pathway, of molecules that link from the surface of cells, which is what's up here, down into the brains of the operation or the nucleus. And this is a pathway that we've actually known for a couple decades at least that it's a major contributor to cell growth, so abnormal proliferation or multiplication of cells. What wasn't known was whether there were any mutations in cancer that actually turned on any of these things. And it turns out that the only one in this part of the bucket brigade that has mutations is this guy, BRAF. These other ones don't. Um, so it took basically genetic investigation um, to try to sort, to, to discover this. And it was found that this particular mutation 
is found in about 50% of all melanomas, which is why someone like me gets to work on this area, because I'm a melanoma specialist, um, but, it, but in about 7 to 8% of all cancers. So you look at other cancer types, and interestingly, even though we don't think colon cancer and melanoma are really related in any particular way, you find these same mutations in a subset of colon cancers, ovarian cancer, and even a few lung cancers, and beyond that, but just uh, pointing out a, pull, a few uh, examples right here. And when this mutation is found, basically it turns on this pathway in a way that almost can't be turned off in a, in a, you know, uh, by the body in a normal way. Um, so this is a potential drug target. And this is an example of where when you find a mutated molecule that seems to be contributing or driving to cancer, it gives you an opportunity to think about directly targeting something like this. Unfortunately, we're not going to find a, an inexhaustible list of these types of opportunities for drugs. And so it, it's already fairly clear to us now that we have to think about um, trying to exhaust this list of sort of genetically altered targets and then also uh, exhaust the list of, of targeting other processes, um, as I alluded to before, and we'll come back to in a moment. Now, to be absolutely clear, there's an enormous amount of genetic alteration in cancer. Uh, melanoma actually ranks amongst the worst um, here compared to other common cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, ovarian cancer, a whole bunch on the left. You see this huge pileup of mutations uh, per amount of DNA. So actually, melanomas uh, arise from melanocytes, which sit on the surface of the skin um, and are exposed to UV radiation, which is the causative factor for melanoma, uh, and pick up a huge amount of genetic, uh, genetic alteration. So when I describe this BRAF mutation, think of a needle in a haystack, because there are so many genetic alterations, most of which we think actually are not really that important in terms of giving melanoma its bad, uh, bad properties. Uh, but there are certain ones within that haystack um, that clearly are important, BRAF being uh, you know, probably the best example we've got so far. And what happens when you take a drug targeting this needle in a haystack? Um, so this thing that nature sort of nominated as being important because there's mutations that sit in one particular position in about half of all melanomas, you create a drug that is specifically designed to block the function of that, of that mutated enzyme, BRAF. Well, here's a patient who has metastatic melanoma. So you're supposed to normally see uptake on this type of scan, black. You're supposed to see in the brain, uh, in the heart, and then the kidneys, which you can't really make out here, and the bladder. Everything else you see, all this other black stuff, is metastatic disease, from which this patient will die uh, in a rather short period of time if something good doesn't happen. Giving a patient a BRAF inhibitor, if their cancer is found to have a BRAF mutation, which was tested for and found in this individual, can have absolutely miraculous effect. Um, in that now you're seeing uptake in just the places you're supposed to see it, um, and everything else goes back to the normal uh, color, if you will, or gray, uh, as opposed to the black. So this enormous amount of metastatic disease in the liver and elsewhere, just early in the course of treatment, two weeks in, just somewhat miraculously uh, melting away. And how does this play out for a population of people treated who have metastatic melanoma who have, whose tumors have these mutations? Well, look, pretty reliably, you see evidence of tumor shrinkage, which is what I'm showing you here on this little figure. 90% of patients, this whole group right here, having some degree of tumor going down early in the course of therapy. Some who actually have the tumor go away completely. A few, unfortunately, who have their tumors grow, despite the fact that their tumors have this mutation and the drugs being given. But still, this kind of reliable effect, this is what we refer to as personalized therapy in cancer, which is the idea that you do something other than just look under the microscope and say this person's got melanoma. You get some greater insight, some biologic molecular insight, and then match a therapy to that. And this is happening in lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, and elsewhere, the same uh, fundamental idea. So this approach, um, at least comparing back to HIV, at least it's like AZT. It's that, it's that therapy that at least beats up the tumor in a substantial way, buys people time, makes them feel better. Um, all good things. But is it a permanent fix? Is it the sort of end solution for cancer? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, now, is this better than we used to do? Yeah, it's better than we used to do. So this is a chemotherapy drug empirically developed and approved uh, for the treatment of melanoma back in the 70s. So here's the percentage of patients who have tumor shrinkage on that. That's generally quite temporary. The vast majority of patients getting no benefit whatsoever. So, so definitely a, a lifting off the ground in this field. But these effects are not permanent. Survival is improved. So here's a randomized clinical trial that was conducted testing this new drug, this new BRAF-targeted drug, to the old chemotherapy drug that had been the standard for years. Um, and this type of trial is essentially the regulatory requirement, if you will. You want to show that this is a drug that really is beneficial to patients, uh, is sufficient to gain uh, FDA approval. 
So what was seen here is that people lived longer. So the yellow, the yellow curve being above the orange curve simply means that the population of people being treated in this randomized trial is living longer. The trial was, in fact, stopped um, very, very early uh, into its conduct because it was so clear that after even just a few months of average follow-up time, uh, the people on the BRAF inhibitor were, were essentially not succumbing to their disease, whereas the patients on the chemotherapy were, as we knew historically, uh, they do. So this was actually halted. FDA approvals anticipated in the next couple of months. But, but notice that there are patients who are still succumbing to their disease. I mean, this is on the yellow curve is not, you know, heroic success. We're done. No more work to, to, uh, to be uh, uh, accomplished. So switching gears and just, you know, covering uh, at least another good example in, in the other end of the spectrum, understanding the consequences of molecular biology. By that I mean if we can't identify in every case of cancer a genetic alteration like BRAF that we can target with a drug and, and, or two or three of those alterations to combine and create uh, this sort of combination approach, as I said, that we absolutely believe is going to be needed, where else can we think about trying to target therapies? Well, it turns out um, that starting back in about the mid-90s or so, an enormous amount of work um, was, in, was uh, put in place by NIH funding in terms of basic science understanding of how the immune system works and how the immune system doesn't work when it comes to cancer. In other words, how can cancer evade the immune system or put it the other way, how could the immune system recognize cancer and actually potentially uh, clear it like it would clear an infection? Turns out that can happen. It doesn't happen nearly as much as we would like, but it can happen that the immune system can do that. So it turns out that the, these, uh, these T cells, as they're called, are the types of cells that can actually eradicate uh, uh, cancer, they also can clear viral infections. Uh, that's, their other, that's their day job, if you will, but their, their other job is that they can, kill, they can eradicate cancers, at least in some individuals. And on T cells, there are breaks, um, as I allude to them here, things that actually turn these guys off. Uh, because think about it, if your body's fighting an infection, you don't want that to go on forever and ever. If the infection's actually been cleared, you have to sort of call off the, the, the troops um, and sort of stop that attack. So there are natural breaks um, on the immune system. And it turns out that cancer actually leans on some of these breaks. In other words, cancer cells uh, learn how to express some of the factors that basically engage the immune cells and tell them to back off, um, which you could say is a problem. Um, it's certainly a problem, but it's also an opportunity because then you can think about the idea of actually creating drugs to block that process, to actually cut the brakes, if you will. Um, and so an example of that is, is, a, is a drug that was designed to block this break and therefore have, a, a, if you will, a positive effect. There's a whole bunch of drugs being developed in this kind of uh, a synapse or interface uh, in the immune system, including some gas pedals that are being leaned on. So there's uh, these molecules here that actually turn on uh, these T cells, and there's a bunch of drugs that are uh, in clinical trials as we speak to actually press on the, on the gas pedal, uh, which is, in theory, similar in the end as, as turning off the brake. But, but which opportunity will be best, we don't yet know. So here's a single patient uh, who went on the trial with metastatic melanoma that's actually not visible on these scans but was visible elsewhere. Uh, here's their liver, this uh, gray uh, uh, organ with the little white blood vessels in there. And then after three months of therapy uh, with this antibody, this drug therapy that's actually meant to uh, pull off the break, if you will, three months into therapy, the tumor is actually getting worse, pretty clearly getting worse. So you see the Swiss cheese appearing in the liver, um, liver metastases that, you know, if this were to continue on, the patient would not survive much longer. No more therapy needed, just this drug being sort of loaded into the patient over a three-month period of time, outpatient treatment, and eventually it starts to turn around. So actually, after the drug's already been given now, the tumors start to regress. A few more months pass, completely regress. This patient's actually alive and well now several years and counting. This is uh, a patient I was treated by a close colleague of mine at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And, and the point being that you can have individual spectacular success with this approach. So I showed it with BRAF. You can have individual patients who do uh, spectacularly well, and some of them even for quite a while. Um, but, you know, does everybody benefit from this approach? No, not everybody. Um, what you see in a large randomized trial where uh, basically two out of the three groups of patients treated received this drug, this immune-enhancing drug, um, you can see that they were clearly living longer with the curves being above the group that didn't get this immune therapy. Um, so there's definitely a difference, and actually what's been gratifying with this type of approach is that you have patients now counting out years of follow-up, two, three years out, who are still alive and well when odds are they would have succumbed to their disease, 
um, as the people did on the other arm of the trial, which is the more typical experience. So it doesn't work for everybody. You still have people succumbing to their disease, but clearly some signs that it can be a game changer for some individuals. So, you know, is there room for improvement? Of course there is. There's room for improvement on the sort of direct mutated gene targeted approach. There's room for improvement here as well. Um, how do we make the big game changing difference? And this is my last slide. Basically, it's ultimately going to be just like HIV therapy, but a little bit more complex because cancer is as complex as the rest of us. Right? Cancer comes from us. Cancer co-ops all of the various programs that at one place in one time in our bodies were part of uh, normal biology, normal development. Cancer ultimately wakes up the programs that are needed to become cancer um, and is fundamentally uh, more complicated than any infection, HIV or TB or otherwise. But still, we've got a pretty deep understanding now of what some of those other processes are. Uh, in other words, we know what some of the other things are that we want to drug, and in actually all the examples that I'm showing you here in melanoma, there are drugs that can accomplish uh, or you know, target some of the things that are listed here, which I'm not going to go through in detail because I really, uh, I'll lose all of your patience if I do that. Um, but suffice to say that you know, looking at the world from a perspective of, okay, if you find a genetic alteration, you can target with a drug. Patient's tumor has a BRAF mutation. You know, where might you build? So the immune therapy that I just talked about that independently works through a very different mechanism, could that work together? Absolutely. Um, are there other genetic alterations in cells that you could target at the same time as this BRAF? Yeah, absolutely. We have all this evidence, um, and there's drugs emerging. The problem is that just in the melanoma field, which is sort of what I'm depicting right here with this little cartoon, we are stacking up quite a backlog of individual drug approaches that by themselves might do something or actually by themselves might not do a lot. They would need to be given in combination to really sort of multiply their effects. We've got a backlog because the scientific and clinical development of individual therapies to date has always been one at a time. In other words, sort of put the blinders on, try to navigate the roughly eight years of clinical trials to establish first safety and then efficacy one at a time. Maybe in combination with classical uh, chemotherapy drugs, as I mentioned, sort of these empirically developed drugs. But the idea of actually combining drugs that each leverage different points of cancer biology, that's rocket science for the field as it stands right now, which is to say that the regulatory environment... Um, the uh, infrastructure for conducting clinical trials at the national and local level, almost every uh, aspect of the system is not set up to facilitate this process. This is melanoma's backlog. In fact, this is only half of our patients in melanoma who have these BRAF mutations in their tumor. So even just for this sort of sliver of the pie, if you will, there's this backlog of different combinations to be looking at rapidly, efficiently, which we're not. In fact, I would say two years ago, <laughs> I could have th shown this cartoon and justified why each of these combinations should be tested. Not a one of them has been tested yet. The first one will, will maybe kick off in about six months after, at that point, what will be about three years' worth of discussion in the scientific and academic community. Um, other ones will follow a little bit behind that, and there's other ones waiting in the wings still. There's 877 drugs in clinical development in cancer right now. That number is only going to increase because the proliferation of the knowledge about cancer biology and creating drugs to try to leverage that is actually exploding as we speak. And the throughput of the system um, is very severe in terms of the bottleneck that doesn't allow basically the more rapid uh, clearance of these uh, sort of scientific ideas into clinical management. Some of them won't work out. I mean, have we ever been wrong in the history of, of, of cancer uh, 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 drug development? Absolutely. Um, but some of them are going to turn out to be right. Um, and if we wait 10 or 15 years, we're actually never even get to some of them because there's so many combinations to look at that we actually pass on some in favor of others, um, then actually we're never going to get to where we think we need to be in this field. So, so there's been an enormous evolution. Um, this is just a nice example with melanoma given the sort of uh, time and place of this field. But in cancer, uh, in a very broad way, a big evolution in the understanding of the biology that allows us new therapeutic opportunities, the ability to sort of proliferate our, the different types of approaches. But to close the deal um, from this point forward actually is going to require a very different way of thinking about how we proceed uh, from this point forward. Um, again, it's been one at a time because it used to be in the era of chemotherapy that only one drug came forward at a time. Um, so a new type of therapy would come along every year or two, um, at, at, if, actually if we were lucky. Um, nowadays, we get you know, new types of therapies 20 at a time. Um, you know, in a six-month period. I mean, this is, uh, we're in the era of uh, explosion in terms of this, uh, these opportunities. But again, closing the deal is going to be the major challenge. So let me stop there and take any questions you have. Thank you. Please. Um, 
I have two questions. The first one, um, this bottleneck, this backlog, um, how much of that is a funding issue? Could you talk about that? Yeah, it's... um. I would say some of it's a funding issue, but not all of it. Um, so, you know, I, I think I and many of my colleagues would say that we're interested in in, in big improvements, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, a fatal disease like cancer, you know, as opposed to those sort of being able to detect, you know, slight improvements in outcome requires thousands of patients treated in a randomized trial to be able to tell uh, an improvement uh, has been achieved. If you're looking at some two-drug combination versus one drug, let's say. But looking for big differences, uh, big, big game-changing differences, doesn't require you know, huge 5,000 patient clinical trials. In fact, a rather modest number of patients under 100 um, can give you that, that answer. So, so if you think about allocation of resources you know, and, and sort of trying to steer away from incremental uh, improvements to more sort of um, multiplicative, synergistic types of improvements, I think actually it's more of allocation of resources than, than total dollars in the system, if you will, in terms of you know, amount of money that goes into executing clinical trials, let's say, or the number of patients that need, are needed to participate in these types of trials. Um, I think it's a strategic issue. Um, there, it, it's a coordination issue. Remember, there, there's no company, uh, pharmaceutical, biotech company, that has all, uh, you know, all science under their umbrella. Right? There's no one entity that sort of has all ideas, all drugs, you know, all targets, all pathways sort of under their watch. Um, the field, meaning you know, various uh, pharma and biotech companies, that, that large umbrella doesn't have a, an incentive to coordinate um, or to you know, work together or to collaborate. There's been just the earliest hints of that happening at all uh, within the private sector. But this is where the public sector has come in uh, and, and can come in. I mean, come in a little bit and can come in a lot more. Uh, the NIH and a specific division within the NIH, well, within the NCI, I should say, uh, sub, uh, you know, a, a subunit of the NCI, um, has a way of sort of bringing together the threads, if you will, from different uh, private enterprises, companies with different drugs and so on. But, but there again, if you were to talk about the bottleneck, well, that, that's another one where the bottle, bottleneck needs to be exploded if we're actually going to deal with the backlog. Um, and you could argue about whether that needs to be in NIH or doesn't need to be in the NIH in terms of where the you know, infrastructure or the uh, sort of um, bringing threads together happens. Thank you. And my other question, the, the slide you had for... Ipilimumab. map. Ipi, Ipi, as we call it. Scans. Yeah. It, did I understand that when you first give the drug, it gets worse, and then you withdraw? Well, that's a that's a it, it, that's a that's a nice dramatic example. So that can happen. Um, I mean, it's not uncommon, which is why I showed that example of of immune responses. Unlike you know, like a BRAF target approach, which tends to work just you know essentially right away. Immune responses can take three, six months um, to actually get them going, um, even though you've been giving the drug, you know, uh, you know, week by week, month by month, in the first several uh, before that. So there's this sort of turning the ship uh, element to immune therapies, um, which actually, on its own, just that those statements that I just made, you could say, well, that's a good reason, even by itself, to think about combining, you know, a drug that works immediately with a drug that takes some time to kick in, because some of our patients actually don't have the time. Literally. I mean, they actually will succumb to the disease within the three to six months that it takes to get the ship uh, sort of turned around. And if we can buy that time with another type of approach, well, that, you know, perfect clinical basis, if you will, for combining. Yeah, please. I might have missed this, but on the BRAF mutations, yeah. what percentage of the melanoma patients have them? 50%. 50%. And then um, are there sets of differences in the incidence of the mutations and or the response here? No and no. Um, the only difference, I mean, it's not along gender lines, but the only difference, just I didn't bring it up for the sake of time and simplicity, is, uh, is actually if you look at the spectrum of age groups affected by melanoma, melanoma ha happens to affect young people more so than many other cancers. So, uh, you know, more common cancers like breast, colon, prostate, and lung typically are of older populations. Melanoma spreads across the age groups a bit more evenly. And the youngest with melanoma, meaning people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, are particularly likely to have a BRAF mutation in their tumor. So I said 50%, but it, actually if you look at people in their 30s, they have a 70 to 80% chance of having a BRAF mutation in their melanoma versus someone in their 80s who's got about a 20, 30% chance. What about familial aggregation? Uh, familial aggregation of melanoma happens, um, but, but, but the, not the BRAF part of it. Um, that's, that's more haphazard, if you will. Uh, it's been co-developed with the drug. So actually, when the drug's anticipated to be approved this year, a test for it, actually there's places, institutions that are already doing testing in their standard pathology laboratory, so it's actually already 
emerging, you know, as the therapies are emerging. Correct, correct, yeah, yeah. So I'll hand back there, yeah, please. Yes. So um, the uh, y- y- the incidence of melanoma is definitely increasing across all age groups. Um, the years of life lost from melanoma obviously have the biggest burden in the young, and there's been an increase, no question, in, in young ages, 20s, 30s, and 40s. We think that has to do sun, – sun, sun exposure is the only thing we know of for certain as a risk factor. There probably are others that we don't yet know about. But um, – so we think that, that that relates to you know uh, sun exposure early in life. Certainly, uh, people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s have had an increase in, in melanoma incidence as well. Um, and, and it's actually, it, in terms of percent increase, it's very similar between the two. So not a big difference there. In terms of rays, I didn't address that again for sort of uh, my haste going through the topic. But but melanoma is uh, it, it certainly spreads differently across. Um, race groups based on pigmentation, you know, inborn pigmentation, not like acquired through a tan, but rather inborn. So Caucasians bear the highest risk, and, and the most extreme example of that is people of British descent who went to Australia and New Zealand. It's, it's there that the, that the biggest burden of melanoma exists uh, far and away. Um, and, and then Caucasians who migrated to Florida and California, uh, you know, or uh, Arizona now too. Um, you, can, you could map out the same you know, sort of type of thing. As soon as you move, actually, to even Asian uh, and Hispanic uh, you know, groups where pigmentation, you know, it's not like the pigmentation is so vastly different, and yet the melanoma risk is much, much lower, and, and people of African descent are, are by far the lowest. It's not to say they never get melanoma, but it's, it's much lower than Caucasians. You may, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this statement, but I'll just address it along these race lines. There's certain types of melanomas that actually spread across the race groups evenly, and those are ones that are not related to sun exposure. Um, so there are melanomas that can arise in the nail beds, the palms and soles, um, and so-called mucosal surfaces, like the sinus passages. Um, those non-sun-related melanomas can happen in the, with the same likelihood in someone of African descent and someone who's Caucasian. But it's the sun-exposed melanomas that distribute so differently. Thank you. Yeah. So it seems like your research was mostly focused on Europe, um, Do you have any other markers of melanoma that can be targeted and just maybe it's present one of these markers? Right. So... Um, so the, take off the first piece, which is that, yeah, there's at least two other sort of, you know, hot targets, if you will, meaning that they're genetically altered. So, so BRAF is, is genetically altered about 50% of all melanomas. In a separate 20% of melanomas, there's another um, uh, element in one of these sort of signal transduction pathways that's commonly mutated. The, the jargon doesn't matter so much, but called NRAS. Um, and here's the challenge with NRAS. So NRAS has a cousin, KRAS, that's mutated in about 20% of all cancers colon, lung, you know, pancreas, and on down the line. And the RAS proteins, NRAS and KRAS, currently have not been amenable to drug targeting. In other words, even though we think we should be able to block them with a the drug, it just hasn't been feasible. Um, and so the approaches have been to try to block what they're doing, you know, like sort of try to t- uh, intercept them uh, indirectly as opposed to directly. Um, but, but there are challenges like that. Um, where we're going we're gonna to keep finding sort of genetic alterations that we can't, you know, sort of get our hands on in terms of a direct drug approach, which is part of the reason why I wanted to, you know, bring in the other, I mean, it is the other big piece of the melanoma story the past uh, decade, um, you know, when you look at sort of the immune system interaction. There's other potential avenues, too, but that's, that's one that's been a success story. The escape from the immune uh, surveillance, if you will, we don't have a fingerprint for that. Um, it's actually a major challenge. You may have heard about uh, drugs that block blood vessel formation in cancer. That's been a, a big area, not in melanoma so much, but in other, in other cancers. That's another one where, you know, in colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, where those drugs can be helpful. We don't know uh, how to test in a way that would tell us who's really going to get a benefit from those therapies and who's not, to sort of personalize those as well. It's one of the major challenges with, with going after those targets that, that are part of the processes of cancer but aren't themselves genetically altered. Because for something that's genetically altered, like BRAF, well, you can just get some tumor cells. Even a little needle biopsy of tumor cells is enough to be able to test for that mutation. In other cancers, the same can be said, where there have been drugs matched to those types of approaches. But, but actually, to gain um, cost effectiveness, if you will, I mean, really effective therapy that works reliably and, you know, and where you don't have to treat you know, large numbers of people to find those who do respond, that personalization, if you will, approach, it requires you know, more development you know, in areas beyond just the mutation testing. That's not going to be the whole answer. So figuring out a signature for who responds to immune therapy is its own um, large side project in terms of trying to figure out what that, what that looks like. 
Uh, but we'll get there eventually, as long as public Dr. Clarity, I'd like to interrupt question and yeah. for a second. Um, we have Congressman Rush Holt with us. Hi. If I'm, actually, I've come in late, so I've missed most of your talk, and I, um, I, I do have one sort of general question, which is related to the reason for this, uh, this luncheon, uh, in fact, this whole caucus, uh, which is our, our need to maintain the uh, research and development infrastructure in America. Um, in particular, in, in this case, the NIH uh, funding, but also all of the supporting work that's done in the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy and all of these other places. My specific question for you, and forgive me if you've already gone over it, as a representative of central New Jersey, um, uh, and having just a week or two ago visited Bristol Myers Squibb and talked to the researchers there, I wanted, uh, I'm wondering if you could say or repeat if necessary, um, the, the relative uh, roles of public sector and private sector funding for the research. Yeah, I, I only alluded tangentially to that topic, so I'm happy to delve into it. So, so what I, the way I generally try to summarize that state of affairs is um, think of the process of, of scientific discovery to clinical application as a pyramid structure of sorts. The sad part of that is the reality that we, you know, relatively few discoveries turn out to be so strong and robust that they relate ultimately to a, a therapeutic success, let's say, or a new diagnostic that's really powerful. So the pyramid, unfortunately, does have that shape. It's not just sort of a rectangle that builds up. But the base of the pyramid is public funding of, of, of basic science research, bi you know, biology research, let's say. But it's not only biology research these days. I mean, in cancer... So, so on this particular medication, what would you say... Well, both, if, what, what would you say were the... The, kind of the general biological yeah. findings right. that may... Uh, yeah, so I, I did touch upon those, and now just to, for, the, for those others in the room, um, just to reiterate those points, that I, I gave two examples of two totally different types of cancer therapies that both came completely out of publicly funded research discoveries. So the genetic underpinnings of cancer, the genetic alterations that are found that, that cause cancer, if you will, um, that has been, been a public investment. And the private sector would never go in that fishing expedition, if you will, to produce that foundation of knowledge. But that's where all of our successful so-called uh, mutated uh, targeted therapies have come in cancer, including the one I talked about today, BRAF. Separately, um, apropos to your visit to Bristol-Myers Squibb, the other example I talked about was a new immune therapy that they've developed um, in melanoma, which was the topic of discussion. And the understanding of the immune system and how cancer sort of hides from the immune system and how you can potentially alleviate that, that com completely came from NIH-funded research. I mean, in fact, the actual molecule that for which the drug was created was discovered by purely on NIH-funded you know, research at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, it wouldn't have happened otherwise. I mean, it's, the, the, those discovery efforts require some patience and some persistence and iterative types of research that the timelines of the private sector, as being someone who conducts clinical trials and sort of knows what the private sector's timelines are, you know, uh, really in spades, they just won't match that. And they don't think they, they can't, their, their management won't tolerate uh, those kinds of, uh, of indefinite timelines, if you will. We as a society have to tolerate that. I mean, we're, we'll never, we never would have gotten where we are with HIV and we'll never get there with cancer if we don't have that tolerance. So, so the, the, the base of the pyramid is, is publicly funded research because out of that percolates the ideas that then what the private sector does is takes basically things that have been nominated from multiple sources, corroborated, if you will, by multiple sources being biologically important, and then they create the drugs. Increasingly, even in the public funded sector, in you know, academic institutions, even drug, early drug development has been happening. But I would say that the domain begins where the private sector comes along, takes what, what the public uh, research domain has nominated as potential therapeutic targets, and creates the drugs, and closes the deal, if you will, in terms of execution thereafter. Increasingly, that, that uh, stratum of the pyramid has now been sort of dissected into biotech and pharma. Used to be that pharma tried to do everything. Um, but for pharma to, do, to cover, you know, 100 different therapeutic areas and different approaches, the inefficiency of that is enormous, and the lack of expertise, actually, is a problem, whereas individual biotech companies have a, have a focus. They have a specific, you know, hypothesis of, of a thing they want to test, a new angle in biology, and they're going to drill in on that. And if they're successful, pharma will come along and take what they've, what they've taken through the first phase um, and take it the rest of the way. So you get this sort of subspecialization there. And then finally, you have an approved drug, I mean, if it's, or, or a diagnostic, and it, you know, at, the, at the top of that uh, sort of final translation piece. But I would break it down just into those simple steps. It all begins with the public investment, absolutely no doubt. 
but as I commented on earlier, uh, one, one question about the issue of, um, you know, can, can the public investment actually help even on the, on the like, clinical trial you know, development piece? Absolutely, and it does help. I mean, the NIH has infrastructure for the purpose of actually, um, just as an example, you have a drug that a pharma company wants to go after uh, prostate cancer and breast cancer because they're very common. But the biology would tell you that actually it might be really important in a cancer like melanoma. But that company doesn't see the market. You know, they don't see the sort of opportunity where it would be worth it to go after a sort of maybe slightly orphan type of indication. Well, the NIH has you know, sort of heroically been there to support you know, those opportunities when the science dictates that, that those should be pursued. And it's absolutely critical, in my view, serving the public interest, that that, that, that be done. Um, because the market forces can't drive everything uh, along the way up in terms of the R&D uh, investment, and including clinical trial execution. So, so the, the, the public investment does, in that level, the pyramid that I talked about in terms of crossing the divide with drug development, it actually permeates up there as well. But the base of the pyramid, as I said, is, is all about public Well, investment. thank you. I hope you got that on film, and I hope those of you who are taking <laughs> notes will carry that back to your members. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I don't know. Great question. Thank you. Others? Yeah, please. So I noticed your slide um, in the BRAF mutation being present in other cancer yeah. from what I said that was the case in other mutations as yes, well. That's right. How is this kind of research really changing the field in terms of collaboration, in terms of moving away from talking about cancer as disease site, organ site specific yeah. to a whole new topic? Right. So, you know, it's not, it, to the scientists, this is not a challenge, right? You just say, okay, look, you know, let's stop calling lung cancer, lung cancer, and melanoma, melanoma. Let's just call it, well, let's, you know, co- based on its common, you know, biologic themes. You know, it, not just BRAF, of course, right? Every cancer is driven by multiple mutations. So it's mutations X, Y, and Z, and it's bad behavior A, B, C, you know, the escape from immune surveillance. Like, you know, but, so you've got this set of signatures about your cancer. You get treated this way. I don't care that it came from the breast or it came from the lung. I, why, why does that matter? Um, the challenge, there is a, a, actually a healthcare delivery challenge uh, that we have to overcome in this being in a hospital-based environment. It's, I'll work on that. But I wouldn't say that this is like, you know, insurmountable. The bigger challenge is actually the paths forward um, in terms of how you establish new therapies along those lines. Because it's still today the case that at the regulatory level, lung cancer is lung cancer and breast cancer is breast cancer. And if you're going to prove that this is an effective therapy, this BRAF inhibitor, it's in BRAF mutant melanoma. If you ran a clinical trial to say, well, but we think this actually is going to help the folks with lung cancer and ovarian cancer and colon cancer who have these BRF mutations, so we're going to wrap all that up in one project, if you will, there'd be no basis for, for, for how you would create um, you know, a, a path, if you will, a regulatory path forward in terms of actually gaining uh, you know, approved status for a therapy along those lines. So it, it currently still, unfortunately, breaks down along these sort of historical antiquated um, systems. So what I always say, um, you know, with all affection for the private sector, I work with them an awful lot, um, they dance to the music that's played by the regulators. Um, and so the FDA sets the tone. Um, I mean, the science should set the tone ultimately, but it's the FDA that is on the, on the other end, if you will, as being the referees that need to respond to, to what the science tells us uh, is how we should be thinking about cancer. And, and let's stop just going with the 100-year-old method of what these things look like under the microscope or where they started from. Okay, I've exhausted you. Thank you. <laughs>